This, as uh, you may or may not have inferred, is our last program of the year. And when I thought about uh, doing a retrospective sort of reflection on the year that's just passed, a highly subjective and random exercise at best, but one that uh, many of us can't resist doing, uh, I only thought of one guest, and that is the guest who is about to join us. He's been on the program several times before. We're always delighted to have him, Nathan Jay Robinson is a PhD uh, candidate in um, sociology and so social policy at Harvard University. He is also the publisher and editor of Current Affairs magazine and the author of several books, including Trump Anatomy of a Monstrosity and Super Predator, Bill Clinton's Use and Abuse of Black America. He is prolific as well as thoughtful and reflective and he joins us now. So, Nathan, thanks for coming back on the program. Well, always nice to be with you, RJ. Well, always a pleasure to have you, as I said. So, uh, 2018 is drawing to a close, uh, and I find myself in the same strange position of feeling the time is accelerating and slowing yeah. simultaneously. You know, it seems like forever. This It seems like this year's gone by in a flash, but it also seems like it's taken forever, as if I'm getting any high-speed data bursts directly into my brain. There's just so much happening all the time. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a bizarre era that we live in when a sort of a... a week feels like it has a decade's worth of events in it. Um, and so as I was looking back, I was trying to think, and I think a lot of people have this reaction because I, I, people I've talked to have said, um, you know, try to think about, look back at 2018, what happened in 2018? And they're saying, well, what did happen in 2018? I can barely remember what happened three weeks ago now, um, because especially with the president being who he is and making, you know, sends 10 tweets every morning that cause an international uh, scandal or incident. Um, it, it can be difficult to, re to remember and things have gone, I mean, things happened this year that seemed like they were many years ago. Um, the beginning of this year, for example, was the was the Parkland uh, shooting and, right. um, and the West Virginia teacher strike. And those seem like things that were, to me, those seem like they were longer ago um, than, than 20 2018. Well, not only do they seem longer ago, but uh, there's something that uh, concerns me about this proliferation of news stories, every one of which I think we all tend to react to as if it was the most important thing that ever happened. And then next week, we're kind of not thinking yeah. about it anymore. It feels like a cheapening of the currency. It feels like a kind of data mm. inflation where I feel like important news stories have become like like cash during the Weimar Republic or something. It's like you need a wheelbarrow full of news stories to buy a loaf of bread now because it's so cheapened. And I, and I worry about that because I worry that we're all developing a kind of moral ADD. That, and I say that, by the way, as a person yeah. who's been diagnosed with ADD, so I'm not minimizing the actual disease, but, but I, I feel that we just, we're outraged and then we move on. And yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? You know, I, I'm not a, a psychologist, but as I understand it, um, people measure time with the, not through actual time, but through the passing of stimuli. So if a hundred things happen, it seems like a lot more time has passed. So there is a sense in which our perception of time uh, has actually accelerated. So the, the experience of time is going by uh, much, 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 much faster. Um, and very recent things seem more, more distant. I blame Twitter a little bit for this because <laughs> every morning I browse through a hundred tweets and you know you, you look at a thing you see a story it flashes before your eyes and then you're on to the next thing and I, I, I agree there there does seem to be this strange sort of nationwide ADD and it's very worrying because if you're going to build um, political movements and political change um, that is all about keeping people's attention on something and the slow process of focusing on one thing and getting people to work really hard on it until you until you can shift it. Yeah, and I think about, you know, my grandfather, who was a union organizer in New York City in the, you know, whatever, the 20s, I guess, uh, labor, you know, the, the garment industry, and day in and day out, they would go and they would march, and they would, you know, collect coins to try to, like, so that everybody could try to feed their family, and he would tell me these stories when I could get him to talk, that goons would 
you know, uh, jump them in alleys or drive their cars into the picket line or do other things to terrify them. And they just showed up and showed up mm -hmm. and showed up. And it seems to me that we need that now, but that, mm -hmm. but that our, 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 our universe of sensory stimuli is working against that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, an example is that here in New Orleans over the summer, there was a gigantic and kind of an amazing protest of Trump's immigration policies and family separation. And I mean, I'd never seen this many people gathered in the French Quarter for anything other than a party, right? <laughs> um, this was this was hundreds and hundreds of people all coming out to protest the immigration policies. And it was very inspiring. Um, it was all over the country. And it was one day. And then the Family separation policies are rescinded a little bit, but it's still, you know, one of our editors is an immigration attorney uh, who works down at the border. Um, and, and as I think everyone knows, uh, conditions down there are cruel. There are tens of thousands. I mean, I think there are about 10,000 children who are incarcerated in detention centers, um, which is a, a lot of children. And in order to, uh, but it's just one of the, of the hundred things we have to be looking at. And so that protest was a one day protest. And then that issue sort of disappeared is from the public consciousness. So uh, that gets to the role of uh, people like you and me, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and and the extent to which uh, do we uh, sh or should we serve the role uh, anyone who's a uh, who, who presumes to be a public commentator in some way uh, should we be assuming the role of sort of I, I hate this word Nathan J. Robinson I hate it but I'm going to use it <laughs> okay right, forgive me it. in advance of, uh, uh, of, of of sort of curating the the awareness uh, of like-minded I hate that word curating cur and it's kind of curators well no no i love museum curators it's when people say uh, we're going to offer you a fully curated meal you know that kind at of least usage. It's not, at least you're not an aggregator i'd rather be a curator than an aggregator that's well, the worst thing to a curator i suppose is a selective aggregator but yes. uh, um in any event uh, do we need people who are willing to take on the role of sort of curating the news feed if you will of yeah. like-minded people, because let's face it, you and I, because of the nature of our work, have the privilege that many other people working for a living do not, which is they have to work for a living. They don't right. have time to spend hours on on uh, social media or news feeds or whatever. Uh, so, you know, I used to I used to advocate this with music uh, you, many mm -hmm. years ago that we need to find with the sudden proliferation of self-made music and the fact that nobody's making money at it anymore that we need to find you need to find a like-minded person and let them recommend music to you now. Right. Should we be doing that function for news? Should we be and should the rest of us be looking for like-minded individuals who will in fact in effect curate curate our news feed for us? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it sounds there's something uh, that sounds a little creepy about like curating people's information and you you know turning to some expert to tell you what matters. Um, but I do think it's it's important to have guidance in a scary and confusing world where you're barraged on all sides by information that you don't know how to interpret, you don't know what to do with, you don't know what matters, and you don't really have time uh, to sift through it. Uh, you and I both do uh, kind of similar things. Your show is quite long and my articles are quite long. And what we do is we go into depth and we try and provide an antidote to this cable, the sort of two minute uh, cable news approach to uh issues of importance where, you know, things just flash on the screen and they're scary and you don't know what to do. Um, and then just move, move on to the next thing. What you, you and I do is we say, well, let's take a particular thing. Uh, let's ignore all of these other things that are superficial and don't really uh, matter that much. And in fact, that's what I do in my Trump Anatomy of a Monstrosity book. I try to distinguish, I try to drill down um, some of the, the things that matter about the Trump presidency and the things that we can ignore, like trying to ignore a lot of superficial stuff, like just, just stupid stuff that he says. Um, 
and try to focus on the policies that hurt people the most and get away from the, just the everyday drama of the White House and think, OK, well, what are the most important policies? Well, you know, it's it's climate change, obviously. Um, it's uh, the border policies. Um, it's economic policies and thinking, well, let's focus in on those. Let's talk about what's going on and let's talk about uh, strategies to fix it. And I, from the reaction of our readers at Current Affairs and probably your listeners, I think people really like that. Um, people really do need someone to just just not I don't like the Vox approach of I'm going to explain everything to you but I'm at least like I'm your ally I'm your friend let's work through this together and try and make sense of it and figure out what matters yeah you know a, a lot there and again we're talking with Nathan J Robinson of current affairs you know I, I uh, love there first of all the Vox approach to me when they started calling themselves, you know, it can be very useful to read Vox. I'm not, you know, they do mm -hmm. some good work there, but I've never liked the phrase data journalism because I've considered it redundant. We're, you know, that everyone who's a journalist should be conveying information. That's the job. And I get what they're trying to say, but this notion also, they, they, they sometimes, you know, continue to seek impartiality. I would rather let people know what my opinions are so that if they choose to, a, you know, a filter accordingly or, 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 you know, do some sort of waiting process for my statements. They're free to do that uh, based on that. But I also, of course, try to be factually correct at mm -hmm. all times. But it's interesting what you mentioned. Yes, your pieces tend to be long. And, and, and when I was writing for the Huffington Post, you know, occasionally and working for a think tank, you know, we hired a digital expert or they did who came in and said, your pieces are, you know, the maximum mm -hmm. piece for a post is 750. People don't read more words. People don't read more than that online. But I mean, people went to me as they come to current affairs when they wanted to read more than that. We found, uh, you know, Troy Miller, the producer here, analyzes our YouTube videos. Uh, everyone says you can't have a YouTube video more than two minutes. Our long videos do no. better. They oh, do, yeah. You know. I, I I had the same experience. Our, our biggest article this year was a an eleven thousand word piece that I wrote dissecting Brett Kavanaugh's Senate testimony, and it was simultaneously one of the longest pieces we had, and it got millions of viewers. And I, I think it's this is just false. I mean, Joe Rogan does a three hour YouTube show, and I don't know how you could watch it for three hours, but people do. It's hugely popular. Yeah, I mean, uh, Fidel Castro's speeches. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even need to finish that sentence, do I? Uh, they would last six hours and then they would be turned into a book, like history will absolve me, which was his, his defense statement at, uh, and you're an attorney, his defense statement when he went on trial in the early 1950s. I'm, I'm not sure quite how excited his audience was about, about the six hour speeches, but yes. Well, a good point. They may, it may not have been entirely voluntary attendance either. But, but uh, the point being, I suppose, that number one, that people, we got into this in terms of curation of news and kind of interpretation, but, but two, the notion that uh, the entire audience for uh, news and, and opinion is now hopelessly uh, attention mm -hmm. fractured, I, I think both of our experiences suggest that that's simply not true, that, that's, right. that there are people out there looking for in-depth analysis and they want it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I can't say that I always give that to them, and, uh, but we certainly try. And you know, what you guys do in a sense is similar to what we as by far, I love reading current affairs because there's also funny stuff and short stuff and stuff that's just the image. Uh, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to uh, hammer people constantly with, uh, I have many words, I'm, I'm important, you know, you can, you can be playful as well. But, mm -hmm. but I think that to me is very important. But going back to this notion of, of, of the long year, the long 2018, mm. um, the, as you mentioned, it began with not just the Parkland shooting, but the teacher strikes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the initial teacher strike in West Virginia. That was a great positive development. I would love to see us spend more time, whether whether the we is a movement of the left or whether the we is people in the journalism and opinion business like ourselves, spend a lot more time reflecting on our victories as well as our losses. Because yeah. that to me was a wonderful victory. 
Yeah, there have been, this year has really been characterized by a mixture of the incredibly scary and horrible and the incredibly encouraging and exciting. I mean, in the scary and horrible category, obviously you have the Parkland shooting and other shootings. Uh, you have the rise of Bolsonaro in Brazil. You have the Jamal Khashoggi killing. You have nearly everything Donald Trump does. Um, but on the other hand, you had all of these incredible political changes. You didn't just have have first the resistance and the activism of the Parkland kids afterwards, uh, the West Virginia, the Oklahoma uh, teachers, um, the elections went very well for Democrats and not just not just centrist Democrats, but um, the Democratic Socialist candidates. We now have with uh, Rashida Taleb and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we have more self-described socialists in Congress than any time since, I think, 1920 or, or whenever there were two socialist Congress people, which right. there were at one brief point. Um, and the DSA did really well in local elections. Um, all of the judges in Houston, all of the Republican judges got thrown out. And you have all these criminal court ju judges who are sort of uh, criminal justice reformer types. In Houston, which was the death penalty capital of Texas for a long time. Um, so there are these incredible changes. The Green New Deal plan uh, is now t picking up steam and has overwhelming support in the polling that's been done, even more support for, for Medicare for All. Um, so, you know, abortion legalized in Ireland. So you have a lot of these really progressive, exciting changes at the same time as you have all these uh, uh, devastating and, and uh, horrendous signs of the apocalypse. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think it's important to balance out uh, the apocalypse and the promising because I think that otherwise people just succumb to despair. Mm -hmm and outrage and I, you know i think that both despair and outrage are strangely addicting emotions that mm. it's very that that despair is a kind of narcotic outrage is a kind of stimulant and either one you can just you know you can cycle between the two based on today's news feed without ever staying in that state of optimistic activation where i think mm -hmm things happen and, and and so I'm really glad you pointed out some of the great breakthroughs we've had in the past year and I would add to that uh, winning some district attorney seats in Chicago mm -hmm. and elsewhere I think that happened in the last year again if you have so long who knows <laughs> right. and, and um, just the opening of the you, you, the tremendous uh, depth of ex acceptance and support for Medicare for all, um, the fact the fact that now for a couple years there's been support for expanding Social Security. There's, been, you know, I have to say, just even in the last five years, things that I would write about five years ago that seemed fringe, and I, you know, I was tilting against windmills to write them that healthcare is a human right, or that Facebook and Google ought to be broken up or regulated as public utilities. Things that people thought were insane in 2014 yeah. are mainstream debate now in 2018. And I think that and, uh, that was not meant to be self-aggrandizing, but just to, because of other people were saying it too, but 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 just to point out that uh, the, the Overton window has, has shifted or at least widened substantially. And for all of that, I think there's genuine reason to celebrate. It's, it's also, if you look at foreign policy and war, it's kind of amazing the shift that has occurred over the past decade or so. Um, when I was in high school in, uh, you know, in 2003 to 2007, uh, with the height of kind of Iraq war fever, where anyone who questioned the war was uh, a traitor, essentially. I mean, you'd be called a traitor. Um, and and now there's this strange anti-war kind of consensus. Uh, the the Senate resolution on on Yemen um, was bizarre. I think was it the first time that the Senate has ever um, condemned a an uh, unlawful military action by the presidency. I mean, it was some milestone. Um, and this is Bernie Sanders pushing for this, and it actually made it through the Senate, which is stunning. Um, 
And, and so there's been a real change. Trump, for all that Trump is, kind of got elected on um, an anti-Iraq skepticism of the Iraq war and foreign intervention. He's now uh, pulling out of Syria, apparently. Um, he's getting a lot of criticism by, by Republicans for that. Um, but it also does seem as if the American public really has no stomach anymore for um, unnecessary Warfare and aggression, and and even uh, even tensions with North Korea have strangely dissipated over the course of the of the last year. And and who would have thought that Trump and Kim would be meeting? Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And by the way, um, you know, I I'm just waiting now for this world weary, eye rolling dismissal of, of Trump's uh, move if he sticks with it to withdraw from Syria by the Democrats and the national security establishment, because that's almost certainly mm -hmm. coming. Uh, interesting uh, interesting uh, political science uh, research done, I don't know if you saw it, Nathan, in uh, 2016, uh, after the 2016 election, showing that uh, towns and cities in Wisconsin, uh, which of course was a swing state that went for Trump, Towns and cities in Wisconsin that had higher than average war casualties in the Middle East uh, voted in larger numbers than would be expected for Donald Trump. In other words, suggests mm -hmm. that Trump's comments about getting out of Iraq and about his lies that he was always against the Iraq war and that he thought, but his all of his conversation, his statements that he was going to be you know, we shouldn't be involved in these countries where we don't belong, which, by the way, I think is correct. Um, I don't think he was sincere, but, but, the, but, but the statements were correct that they could have actually helped change the outcome of the 2016 election. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you absolutely. I mean, I haven't d dived into the political science research, so I can't, you know, uh, speak to its em empirical uh, claims. But I mean, that does feel right. I mean, you do see an anti-war consensus emerging. You do see that the justifications, when the justifications for the Iraq war collapsed, um, pretty much everyone other than narrow members of the, uh, even, even the people, even the most vocal supporters of the Iraq war never talk about it anymore. You know, people like Bill Crystal now presents himself as a member of the anti-Trump resistance and uh, every, and all of the sort of um, establishment conservatives lamenting the decline, uh, the closing of the weekly standard, for instance, which just shut its doors. Um, careful not to mention uh, Iraq anywhere in their eulogies for this great conservative paper uh, because they know that this is an embarrassment and that neoconservatism with its uh, you know, foreign aggression and, and nation building projects, um, it, it really just has absolutely no popular support now, which is, uh, well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, the closing of the weekly standard uh, I'm grateful for for a number of reasons, including the fact that it gave me an opportunity <laughs> to use the phrase good riddance to bad rubbish, which I hadn't used for some time. Oh, yeah. But um, so let's talk about another event of an event that I consider of minimal import, frankly, in the grand scheme of things, mm -hmm. but one which got an enormous amount of press coverage and which I think is symbolic of a, a number of structural problems we have with our uh, our politics and our media uh, landscape right now, and that would be the death and funeral of George H.W. Bush, oh. uh, <laughs> which you have written about. So yeah. I, I would call it a ritual reaffirmation of allegiance to a disconnected elite that has uh, led us into mass slaughter and economic uh, harm of almost incalculable proportions, a kind of orgy of self-congratulations in which both Democrats and Republicans celebrate their allegiance to one another at the expense of the American population. But your thoughts? Yes, uh, or orgy of self-congratulation is a polite euphemism for a circle jerk, which is exactly <laughs> what the, the coverage of uh, George H. W. Bush's death uh, kind of seemed like. Which is, you, you know, I, I wrote actually about the way that the mainstream media covered this incident, um, and it, the New York Times was bizarre. I mean, they had uh, he was the, the the full page headline on the day of his death, then full page the day afterwards, and basically about a week. Large parts of the paper were taken up by uh, George H. W. Bush's death, and I, I pointed out in the article that I wrote um, that 
I almost think that I, I, I provocatively said that in a sane and healthy country, uh, the death of a president wouldn't even make the front pages because you wouldn't see your presidents as being that important. Right. They'd just be a public servant. Um, you don't want people who are who are that uh, that important. Um, but the coverage not only uh, was just this 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 more this mass natural national mourning ritual, but of course also. Um, was propaganda because it didn't actually, it, it whitewashed his legacy. And you go through all of the things that went either unmentioned or very quickly dismissed, like his imprisonment of Haitian refugees at Guantanamo, um, like the way that when the United States downed an Iranian airliner and killed nearly 300 people, H.W. Uh, Bush said he would never apologize for America no matter what the facts were, which is just a very radical view of America always being right. Um, and then the atrocities during the Gulf War, I mean, the mass killing of uh, civilians in the air raid shelter, um, the uh, the massacre of fleeing Iraqi soldiers on the highway of death, lots of things that should be truly, oh, and of course his uh, uh, serial sexual assault of women uh, bears, I think bears mention in the Me Too era, we should recognize that you, you, that that's part, if that's part of your character, it has to be mentioned. Uh, um, it, at least um, you, you shouldn't be portrayed as a, um, a, a wholly good person, which is what a lot of the coverage was. It was. No, it, um, yeah. And also they, they neglected to mention the fact that um, uh, his pardon of uh, some of the major players in the Iran-Contra scandal, uh, a scandal in which he had at least at one point been implicated, uh, was outraged the special prosecutor who was appointed to handle that, who mm -hmm. felt that uh, this made it impossible to get to the truth of what really happened. So also, you know, his... Yeah. That, and that's so I would consider that shady dealings in the Iran-Contra scandal as yeah. well by, by his giving out of pardons. Uh, and let's face it, a former CIA director has probably done some things we don't know about that we wouldn't really approve of if we did know about them. Uh, so, but this orgy of congratulation, it struck me, and, and by the way, Parenthetically, and I'm probably going to alienate at least a couple of my own listeners now, but uh, Michelle Obama this week doubled down oh. on, on her praise for George W. Bush, as I, 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 oh. I, I may talk about it in a monologue, but as a kind, sweet, warm, funny, warn, wonderful man who beautiful. just killed it. She called him beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, he did. <laughs> Look, on the one hand, he killed a million people needlessly in a war based on utter lies. But on the other hand, he painted nice pictures of clowns. So I guess, and he gave her a piece of candy. So I guess it's a wash. He did give her a piece of candy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she called him uh, her partner in crime, which, I mean, I mean, I'm not disputing that he is a criminal, but right, it's right. a very... Uh, not a strange expression to use because I don't think that's the way that she meant it. Um, yeah. It shows me it's a little disturbing in showing you how easily you know, prolonged exposure to elite circles can make you completely unaware of the human consequences of politics. Right. Um, because I, I like Michelle Obama. I, I really do. I, I, I've just been uh, reading bits of her book. Um, I think she's a good person. I have no reason to think she isn't. Um, but she just seems to end Barack Obama, of course, um, was known for opposing the war from the from day one. That was one of his proudest moments. So it's very strange that she could be so um, blind to what the Iraq war meant for its victims. Uh, and it really does suggest, it, it tells you a lot about what this bubble does to people and how it corrodes your um, moral compass. Well, absolutely. And by the way, I like Michelle Obama, too. And, uh, you know, someone who has a black goddaughter and black godson, you know, is delighted to see, you know, the, the hope and joy that it brought to so many lives to have them in the White House and rightfully so. But this to me, yes, yeah, so the detachment is exactly right. And to me, from a, uh, the inability, the, the, the difficulty that one faces, for example, criticizing Barack Obama's policies, on the on the putative left, anyway, uh, people get so angry. Uh, uh, the one thing that I found perhaps not so encouraging about the past year is uh, the eager continued eagerness of so many liberals, I guess you would say, and Democrats to look for the next savior rather mm. than for the next policy. The idealization of Beto O'Rourke, for example, who clearly has, uh. from a progressive point of view, considerable clay feet 
but he's young and he's handsome and he's charismatic and he's charming and um, you know to me this this is a discouraging development because this means mm -hmm. that uh, people have not gotten over what a friend of mine calls their candidate addiction and uh, what what I consider you know the the urge uh, really among Democrats and, and liberals interestingly enough it's almost an, an, an authoritarian urge to just find a great leader and follow them and not have to worry about all this stuff ourselves. And it, it also comes from being desperate. People just want someone who will save them from Trump. This is why there's all this uh, W. Bush nostalgia in part because uh, he looks so much better by comparison. And it doesn't matter that Beto O'Rourke, uh, his actual congressional record is uh, pretty conservative. Um, you know, he, he seems way better. He, he, he seems clean cut. Um, Beto O'Rourke, I mean, he really is. He, he's a man with, we've, dug into his record. He's a man really without much substance. I, I mean, I, I'm i basically convinced that he's almost just a, a, a nice haircut. Uh, because if he if he was bald, if he had no hair, we wouldn't be talking about him. It's just that he looks nice. He looks like he looks like he could be president, and that's why he's Kennedy esque because he looks like he could be a Kennedy. And so let's make him the president. He's better than this guy. Um, and I think this is really worrying because I don't actually think this tendency is necessarily shared by the rest of the country. Because I'm not sure that if the Democrats run someone who's uh, on a I'm not Donald Trump platform in 2020, I'm not sure that they're going to win because. Uh, my instinct is that voters turn out when they are passionate about things, um, and that's what causes them to go to the polls. I mean, maybe the hatred of Trump is strong enough. I mean, the midterms, the Democrats did very well, and I think they're hopeful for 2020. But I mean, you saw the impact of complacency in 2016, uh, what it did. And I'm worried when I see complacency, which is like, we just need a person. We need any person. Now, Joe Biden literally said this. Joe Biden said, I think, he said this the other day, I think anyone could beat Donald Trump. And that just, just seems obviously untrue because they ran someone. Anyone. <laughs> and, and, right. and she lost. <laughs> right, that was exactly the attitude that led to the defeat in 2016. And, and in the best case scenario, I feel it's almost kind of Nietzschean eternal return or at a minimum, a Battlestar Galactica, all this has happened before and will happen again, which is, I could uh, suddenly when I hear that, uh, when I see the Beto adulation, I see the next 10 years play out as the last 10 years played out. The, the charismatic Democrat, maybe he wins, but loses both houses of Congress, loses a thousand legislature seats in states, state houses around the country. And, as people gradually realize that this is one more false promise presented to them in a nice package. Um, but then what do I know? Because I don't have presidential hair anymore, so I, I, I can't possibly Sorry. have an opinion on this. Yeah, yeah, it was a little touchy, but okay. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. I knew Nathan J. Robinson. We would have no problem uh, covering the past uh, year and undoubtedly leaving out many critical things for which we will be roundly chastised on social media, but uh, and rightfully so. Um, but any closing thoughts? Well, the New York Times just ran an article called uh, uh, pondering the question of whether it would be better off if humans went extinct uh, because this year was so bad and our destruction of the world is so bad. And I just think that when you look over at this past year, you can come to that conclusion that human beings would be better off extinct because it's so bad. Um, but I would encourage people who feel depressed at the end of this year, who think it's just been a disaster, um, to, I don't want to say look on the bright side, but it, it really is very mixed. I mean, on the one hand, Anthony Bourdain is dead and Henry Kissinger is still alive. Uh, but on the other hand, we met Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez this year and, um, you know, nobody had heard of her before June and she defeated a 10-term um, incumbent with no money. And so great things can be done. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I think <coughs> at this point, extinction is going just a little bit too far, but check back with me again this time <laughs> next year. Um, so Nathan J. Robinson is always uh, a great pleasure speaking with you. Uh, Nathan J. Robinson is, of course, the editor and publisher of Current Affairs magazine and the author of uh, Trump, Anatomy of a Monstrosity and Super Predator, the book about Bill Clinton's use and abuse of black America. So Nathan is always a pleasure and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks, RJ. Have a good 2019. Thank you. You too.